Hey, this is attorney Elizabeth Potts Weinstein. Today we're going to be talking about eight different reasons that trademark applications to the United States Patent and Trademark Office get rejected and how to prevent that from happening or deal with the rejection once you get it. Now to make sure we're all on the same page, how it works in the trademark office when you file a trademark application is it gets assigned to an examiner and then sometime later, right now it's taking like nine months, so an examiner actually looks at your application and they might accept it or they might come to you with an email or they don't really call us anymore, but they might email you and say, here's a little tweak that needs to be done. Or they come up with a formal office action. And that office action may include rejecting your application. But here's the thing to know is you get really two chances, in some ways you get three, but two chances at least to respond to that. You get one chance just outright normally where you have a six month period of time, it's three months with a three month extension to reply to them. And then If they still reject it, you get another period of time to reply. And then you can also appeal and ask for reconsideration and stuff. So you get a couple different chances here to deal with any rejection. Now, some rejections are much more easy than others. And so let's kind of break it down on the kinds of objections you may get or rejections you may get from the examiner at the Patent and Trademark Office and how to deal with it. So one very common one is that you're in the wrong class or you have the wrong class description. Whenever you file a trademark application, it is in a particular class. So a trademark application for t-shirts is in a completely different class than one for life coaching, all right? And you have to be specific, not just in the number class, so saying it's class 30 or 42 or whatever it is, but also the kinds of services. So clothing usually isn't actually what we put it under. We put it under t-shirts or shoes or hats or all of those things. We also, life coaching can be a class, but typically it is life coaching, namely, and then we go into the in the, something in the field of and have a much longer description. So sometimes the trademark office will come back with an objection. They'll either say you're in the wrong class. Maybe you talked about coaching, but you're actually were talking about financial coaching, which is a different class than regular life coaching. I know it's complicated. Also, maybe your description you said was not acceptable. It used to be, for example, I, when I had clients who used to do classes and events and stuff like that, I would put them in a class where I'd have one of the descriptions be events. But that got eventually rejected by the trademark office all of a sudden, and they decided that the word event is vague. I don't know why. Okay. <laughs> they just do that sometimes. Now, the reason this is usually not a hard thing to deal with is usually the examiner will come back with a new description that they want you to use. And almost always I say, okay, that's fine. Because the thing is, it's usually semantics. It's usually like, instead of the word event, they want me to use the word seminar. <laughs> like It's usually little tiny tweaks that doesn't matter. Or they want you, instead of being in a life coaching class, to be in the financial coaching class. And it changes the number of class, but it really is actually what you do, and that's fine. Now, sometimes they will actually want to break it down into a bunch of different classes. They'll say, oh, this class that you filed under, actually, these little parts of your description go in this class, this class, this class. And if you want to actually accept all that, you got to pay the filing fee for all those different classes, another 250 bucks for each one of those classes, most likely 250 if you're using the class descriptions in the database, which I highly recommend doing. So generally speaking, if you're in the wrong class, they will tell you what to do. And if you're okay with that, if that is correct and you have the budget, then you go ahead and do that. So it's relatively straightforward. The second is, let's say your trademark application, the trademark that you file, doesn't match how you're using it, what's in your specimen. So when you file a trademark application, you either at the time of filing or later when you do, if you did an intent to use application, you have to file a specimen, an example, proving up that you use your trademark. So let's say you sell t-shirts, then you would have a picture of your t-shirt that has the trademark on the tag or the label or the packaging or something like that. And sometimes those get rejected. Now, sometimes they get rejected because you actually filed the wrong specimen. So you filed a trademark application for t-shirts and you took a picture of your website. That ain't going to work for t-shirts. You need a picture of the t-shirt. It's a product. So if a product with a picture of the trademark on the tag or label or packaging. If it's for a service, a lot of times you do take a picture of 
a screenshot of your website or however you offer your services, it is done a little bit differently. So sometimes you just don't have the right picture of the right thing. But sometimes it's that how you use the trademark doesn't match the trademark. So for example, let's say I was trademarking Elizabeth Off Grid, which is actually a trademark application I have currently pending. But instead of being Elizabeth Off Grid, three separate words with a space in between. I How I actually, I applied for it that way, but I actually use it with no spaces. All the words all run in together, Elizabeth Offer. I would get re- rejected because how I use it is different than the trademark. And this comes up a lot with spacing, with dashes, with whether or not you use the word the. You know, there's things where your trademark is not how it matches up with your actual use. And where I see this come up a lot is with intent to use applications because you filed that application a year ago and now you're actually using it and you ended up tweaking things. So you really want to make sure that it matches up. And this is something that can be hard to fix. You might have to file a new application. They'll tell you what you need to do if you need to just submit a new specimen or what. The number three thing, which is something that can be difficult to deal with, is if you're a merely descriptive. So for example, so let's say I wanted to trademark the words small business lawyer. That isn't really a great trademark because small business lawyer is just a description of me, right? Or small business legal services, or let's say I wanted small business contracts. You know, like this is just generic words for either my business, for the kind of business I have, for the industry category, for the thing that I'm doing, for the result that I provide. So It depends on what the rejection is for how you deal with it. Sometimes they say, look, you're literally trying to to trademark the generic words and they won't let you trademark it at all. But usually what they'll do is they'll say, you can go on the supplemental registrar. And the supplemental is not as good, okay? It's more difficult for you when you want to sue someone for infringement. But you still get to use the R with a little circle around it and it's still registered trademark and you still can say what, you know, send a cease and desist letter to stop someone from infringing. It just means you have a larger burden of proof if and when you sued someone. So it's better to not have the supplemental, but sometimes that's the best that you can get. Now, occasionally I actually am able to overcome this by going into a legal brief of how it is not merely descriptive and I'll have all kinds of examples and stuff, but that probably is beyond what you're going to be able to do as not a non-lawyer person. The fourth is that you need a real address. Okay, so when you file a trademark, there's a new-ish rule that you don't just give them your mailing address, which could be a P.O. box, whatever, a virtual mailbox address, but you have to give them a domicile address. Domicile address is has to be a real address, okay? I don't mean some virtual mailbox, UPS store, Regis, whatever. It has to be a, the real place where the business is located, where the owner is located, where the officers work, whatever. This can be a really big issue for people who have home businesses where they work from home, someone who is outside the United States. And because the thing is, the trademark office wants to know where you're really located. It's a fraud prevention thing. I don't, I think it's actually ridiculous, but that's just the rule that we have to deal with now. So if you have a business that is completely online, they want to know where do the workers work? Where do the officers work? And even if you formed your LLC or corporation here in the United States, you still have to give them a location address. And if it's a virtual business that's on completely online and you just use some virtual mailbox service, they're going to look up that address. They have access to the USPS database to see what kind of address it is. And then if it's a PMB address, they can tell. Obviously, it's a post office, you know, PO box, they can tell. They go on Google Maps and look at the building. They figure it out, okay? So you will have to give them a domicile address of where the owner is or where the business is located or one of the owners. Now, that address is supposed to be not public. I'm not going to promise you for sure that it never gets hacked, but it's not publicly available in the public database. So the reason this could be a big issue goes to the next part, which is if you're not domiciled in the United States, if the owner of the LLC isn't here, there's no office here, whatever, then you have to have a lawyer represent you before the Patent and Trademark Office. You might be able to get it on file without that if you're able to get your ID.me login to work. And it seems like they are now starting to approve people who are outside the United States who don't have a U.S. passport for that. However, however, then you will get this rejection saying you have to have a lawyer. 
And the short answer is, yeah, you got to need a lawyer. I mean, I'm, I'm, that's just how it is. Okay. So you could hire a lawyer like me who is just a freestanding attorney, or you could go with a service, but it has to be a service that is lawyers. So Trademarkia does that. LegalZoom does that. Of those two, I'd pick Trademarkia, but it has to be a service that has lawyers that work there that are going to be representing you. It cannot be something that is just a filing service. It has to be actual lawyers. All right, let's go into the sixth thing. This is the hardest thing to deal with. Okay. And this is confusion, likelihood of confusion. So this is, they come back and say, there's this other trademark that was filed before yours or an application that was filed before yours and your application overlaps with theirs and would cause customer confusion, likelihood of confusion. This can be very surprising sometimes because you may think, well, yeah, that there's this other trademark, but it's not exactly the same as mine. I have extra, more different words I've added on. And also they're in a different class. Should Why is that confusing? So the trademark office has figured out kind of a coordinated class system. So there are certain classes that cover the same kinds of businesses. So for example, if someone's a life coach, a lot of life coaches have podcasts. And while a podcast, a downloadable podcast is actually in the product category, weirdly, because downloads are things, whatever, it's just how it works. Podcasts and life coaching are coordinated. So if you file for a podcast and someone else has that same trademark for life coaching, they will deny you for that. So there's a no, and there's, that's true also in products, all kinds of different products and services have overlap in that way. So even if you have, your description is different, even if it's a different number of class, you can still get that kind of rejection. Also, the words don't have to be exactly the same. They just need to be similar enough such that customers would be confused. That's really a vague standard, isn't it? It's really hard to know when people be confused. So how do you deal with this? So typically what I do with clients, first I, I look in, at the details. You know, maybe they filed in three different classes and we're just going to drop one of the classes. I mean, sometimes that can happen. But most of the time, this is where you have to actually write a legal brief and go in, show a bunch of other examples, prove up why they're not, it's not confusing. Occasionally we win these, but it is, I would say, 50-50 whether or not it's possible to win. These are much harder to overcome. It's the hardest thing to overcome. So just be aware that that happens. You have sometimes it actually is cheaper and better to rebrand if it's the beginning of your business than try to overcome that because it might be really expensive. The seventh is something that's usually pretty easy is that you need a disclaimer. So let's say I wanted to trademark EPW small business law, okay, which I have not trademarked because I don't think it's a very good trademark, but let's just say I did. I could probably get that because of the EPW. The EPW is the thing that's different. But the small business law is just the general words. And I don't have a right to like stop everyone who uses the words small business law in their business because that's not really fair, is it? Like all kinds of people are using it already. It's just a description of the category of things. So probably what would happen is the trademark office would come back and make me disclaim one of those words. They make me disclaim the word law for example, or the word business, probably not the word small, but uh, they maybe disclaim one or two of those words. And the idea of the disclaimer is you're saying, I don't have any dibs on that word outside the context of this entire trademark. Now, sometimes that actually is not the right thing to do. Sometimes you should fight that because if you have a phrase that has this kind of that, that where the words put together are beyond what any of the meanings are. There's this like clever turn of phrase aspect to it, this clever connotation. Sometimes you can overcome that, but as it, that's like one of those things that's kind of beyond getting to that is a difficult thing to do because it, it requires a lot more legal arguments. But most of the time, I just accept the disclaimer. The eighth thing is that is if you are not the trademark is not identifying the business as the source of products and services. This is something is actually hard to explain. I've had this rejection a couple of times for clients when they just do not understand what the problem is. And it is because it's a very subtle issue. So a trademark, the idea of a trademark is that that branding identifies your business as a source of those products or services. It isn't just something about you. So for example, let's say I did want to trademark small business lawyer, which is obviously I talked about what's terrible trademark, but let's say I did. And the only specimen, the only example I have is in my bio, I say Elizabeth Potts Weinstein, small business lawyer. And then I go into is blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like my bio paragraph. That isn't going to fly because it has, it identifies me 
the person who owns this business, but it doesn't identify the business as the source of these legal services. I know it's a really subtle distinction, but this comes up typically, and that's the where it comes up, is where the trademark, it's almost like this tagline for the person who is the person who owns the business or is providing the products or services, not the business itself. So those are the eight rejections that I have seen the most over the years and how to overcome them. Obviously, there's all kinds of other little bits and things that can go wrong, but those are the biggest ones. So if you have any questions about what we talked about today, feel free to leave them in the comments below and I'll try to point you in the right direction. Thumbs up if you found this video helpful. Subscribe for more videos like this. Good luck with your trademark application and I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.